Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this Agora Sara Week conversation presented by IHS Market. My name is Rebecca Hoffman, and I will be your moderator for this panel. Currently, I serve as the president for Blockchain for Energy, a consortium of major energy companies who learn, lead, and leverage blockchain technologies to bring about transformational change for the energy industry. We have an impressive panel for you today, of which none of them actually started their careers in technology, but were naturally led to it along the way. Our first panelist is Raquel Clement. Raquel has a distinguished 24-year career with Chevron in a variety of senior roles covering upstream, midstream, downstream, and corporate functions. She joined Chevron's Surface Digital Platform in 2020, where she is primarily engaged in digital innovation and software applications. Her role helps to better enable facilities and production operations across the company's value chain. She also serves as chairman of the board of directors for Blockchain for Energy Consortium. Raquel holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and an MBA from Rice University. Thank you, Raquel, for being here today. Our next panelist is Vishal Mehta. Vishal has held leadership and entrepreneurial positions in business, consulting, operations, leading large teams across multiple regions, working for diverse global clients in oil, power, infrastructure, real estate, pharmaceuticals, steel, metals, mining, fertilizing, retail and government in lots of areas. He specializes in transformation initiatives utilizing emerging technologies to get exponential business value. In his current role for Worley Digital, he leads the digital platforms, data science, AI, AI scaling, and monetizing the investments done in these digital portfolios. Vishal also serves as a board member for Blockchain for Energy Consortium. He is a chemical engineer and has a master's in carbon management from the University of Edinburgh. Our last panelist, but not least, is Thomas Cox. Thomas has earned four-year degree in psychology in just three years with honors from the University of Chicago. He began his technical um, technology career at Oracle and spent 15 years architecting, designing, and building databases from, for companies across multiple industries. Thomas then pivoted from databases to human systems. He spent 10 years studying leadership, teamwork, and what he calls the problem of cooperation. Four years ago, Thomas was recruited into the $4 billion ICO for EOS and was the principal designer of version one of EOS mainnet governance. Thomas has been focused on blockchain governance ever since. And we're all better for it. He on. chairs the working group blockchain governance standards for IEEE Standards Association and is now working with Blockchain for Energy Consortium as their governance expert. So thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. So let's dive straight into some deep questions. <clears throat> um, there has been an evolution of blockchain and the technology continues to expand along with its potential. Why use blockchain technologies in the energy industry? What potential benefits are there? I'd like to start this off with you, Thomas. Right, well, blockchains are nothing more than big, slow shared databases. And uh, they have a couple of attributes, one of which is um, you can't have your own separate version that's different from my version. We either all agree on a thing or it is, it is in there. Uh, and so it, they're handy for creating shared sources of truth if you're all willing to trust each other in terms of what's going into them. Uh, that's huge for any two organizations that are either you know, large enough that they have internal coordination issues 
and or if they're cooperating frequently and need to trust each other around the details of provenance of objects or chain of custody uh, or just basic facts in a way where they can all have confidence that the data that's come in, uh, someone's taking responsibility for it, that it hasn't been changed after it's been created. Uh, so blockchains give you that kind of uh, uh, ability to trace data back to its source. Uh, and you can have some confidence that no one's gone in a back door and, and tweaked what's on there. You can still lie to the things. You can still put bad facts on chain, uh, but they have a lot of uh, good protections that give people permission to uh, trust the data more than they could otherwise. Thank you, Thomas. Can, Raquel, can you expand on that? Um, yes, definitely. Um, uh, right on, Thomas. We have to expand. The blockchain enables us to have more transparency, visibility, and traceability of our transactions in an easier way. Right now, we have to. We have so much reconciliation, verification that happens across companies, across our vendors. That is, 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 a, is a challenge that we have to be able to, to overcome. I mean, that efficiency only, it will help us save millions of dollars and time work of our workers, you know? So, so for me, the, the provenance is, is one of the big ones that we can start ho hopefully tackling with blockchain. And we have seen demonstration. I mean, we have seen examples now live that we can do it. So. So definitely combining um, blockchain with IoT, smart contracts, uh, putting all that data in a distributed ledger that is transparent for everybody uh, is really a, a, cha uh, a game changer. And uh, it, it will be even the possibility of having no invoices or no need for field ticketing, reconciliation in the fields. That will be a, an outstanding efficiency achievement for all of our companies. If I can uh, emphasize, when you go from having to reconcile two systems to having a, a single system that continuously uh, reconciles, uh, it, it's instead of fighting over what the truth is, you can start to fight over what to do about what the truth is. Exactly. And that's you know that, that's the fight you want to have. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Vishal? Right. Yeah, no, great points, uh, Thomas and Raquel, and thanks, Rebecca. I think I think uh, most of the points were made by Raquel and Thomas, but a few things that I feel is that the energy industry is complex. It's it's more volatile than what it was, and and so there is a big need for an ecosystem or a business model shift, and 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 you know, blockchain brings that next level. You know what internet did for uh, the lot of the platform companies. I feel that blockchain can do that for, for the energy sector, especially around the need for transparency, you know, uh, whatever is happening around us around climate change, uh, data security, uh, timeliness, consistency, or exponential uh, improvement and efficiencies in everything that we do. And I think the whole energy sector uh, is going to become a, a more of a, a ecosystem, distributed ecosystem play uh, with, with a lot of these uh, climate change related initiatives that are currently ongoing and decarbonization as well. So, so blockchain offers that opportunity to pivot from you know, the problems that we are having in the energy industry to a more newer business model uh, that's, that's decentralized, that's an ecosystem play and provides accuracy, allows collaboration, consistency and security. So Raquel, thank you, Vishal. Absolutely agree with that. And and Raquel, can you give us some real examples? Um, well, um, Rebecca, we're very familiar with one project that you led before, uh, the water hauling pilot that was sponsored by Equinor that we did through the consortium. That proved exactly what some of these points. I mean, we completed uh, these using existing sensors in our in the, in the equipment. Uh, and we demonstrated that it's possible to reduce the procurement to pay from 90 days to less than a week. And to be honest, if we want to potentially minutes, uh, having the transparency, the, the combination of the IoT and the smart contracts, but also the, the use systems and, and the water holding uh, ticketing. And that's, a, that's an inefficiency that we have built in our systems, that we have a truck that goes and gets 
an amount of water and, and we didn't have a way to really assess what was that amount of water. We didn't have visibility of how much we were producing, how much we were taking out of that water in real time. We needed to wait for the information to come days later. And now with a blockchain system, we can have, um, implementing blockchain, we can have that information like in seconds, you know, and everybody, as, as Thomas was mentioning, is not about what is, what is if, if it's true or not, it's more the conversation is what do we do about this information now and how can we improve it? How can we optimize the system instead of spending months on saying these invoices really true or or why are we spending more in this one? Or why why your system says X and then my system says Y? It's more about, hey, now that we know exactly how much we're using and how much water we're holding, how can we save money? How, how much are we spending in a day to day? And we don't get that information so delayed that the, that the conversation started getting iffy. We get it in real time. So, so those are the benefits that we have demonstrated that we can do uh, for to make fa better and faster decisions with the added bonus of no hand intervention and reduction of reconciliations. And we're moving it forward to other commodities. We can implement it and we're starting to study for chemicals and it's unlimited the options for us to work on this. Yes, thank you, Raquel. There's actually, I think, four different major projects that the consortium's working on. But Thomas, you've been in other industries um, as, as well as now coming alongside the energy industry and helping us. Uh, what have you seen out there in real examples? Gosh, um, I got to narrow it down to just a few. One yeah. I like that I don't know if you guys even know about is, or maybe you do, uh, was scheduling tankers in the North Sea to line them up, you're nodding. Okay, you've heard about this one. It was news to me when it, when it came out that um, there were so many players involved in, you know, which barrel of oil coming out of which, you know, North Sea rig was going to go into which ship when and who would own that barrel. And it was, and they were like trading the rights to the oil while it was being pumped. And it was just a mess. Um, and of course, it's to nobody's benefit to have a, like some kind of a traffic jam where you can't load sh ships. So there's this shared need for clarity and they were able to come up with a blockchain solution to have everyone throw their data into a shared pool where it was clear where it was coming from and who were signing their, their, their statements. So and Thomas, you could even say time. traffic jam, but paper jam too, right? Oh, I'm sure. I can't <laughs> imagine trying to Total. make that work on paper. Uh, I'll give you one of my favorite examples is uh, from agriculture. It's an outfit called Grain Chain. Uh, and they started off as an internet of things play where they would measure uh, the grain coming in from a farmer's field at the grain silo or wherever they were collecting the, this, uh, the harvest to weigh it, measure it, acidity, color, moisture, all the different uh, variables, pesticide levels. And they would flag that uh, and they were able to put that on a blockchain. Uh, and then they found they were having data entry problems because if you've got someone typing away uh, at the grain silo and they put in the wrong farmer's name because they're like trying to, try to multitask. Oh, it's on the chain now, you, it's hard to fix that. Uh, and so they went upstream and they built an Uber type app where the farmer can request a truck and the truck, the trucker has an app and says, I'll pick that up. And so you're collecting data about the latitude and longitude and provenance of the stuff before it even gets to the silo. So then when it shows up to, to be weighed and measured, you're weighing and measuring a thing you've already collected data about on chain and you're getting rid of the human data entry, which is a big deal, getting rid of human data entry. Um, what I also loved about grain chain is the way they do their governance is they have a rule that you can't change the rules during the growing season, only between seasons. Uh, that's an important kind of meta rule about the rules. And all the farmers collectively get one vote and all the finance people and banks and whatnot get a vote and all the buyers get one vote and the voting has to be unanimous. So all the farmers get to fight over which way to cast their one vote. And what this gives you is protection so that you don't have like 12 farmers outvoting two banks on what interest rates should be or some other thing like that. It's like no bank would play that game. It's like having two wolves and a, and a sheep vote on what they have for lunch. Uh, and so, <laughs> it becomes really important when you're going to start pooling your interests and working together more closely 
uh, is in blockchain does that. It thins the barriers between you know, organizations. Um, you've really got to be protected. And so uh, it, it gives rise to yet more problems of cooperation, as I, as I like to call them. Uh, so, yeah, so grain chain's a great example. Uh, Simba chain is all over the federal government now, uh, providing uh, uh, track, tracing and tra uh, traceability for uh, military activities. There's the ability to download uh, a 3D printing file and, and 3D print an object and pay for the rights to use the design at the time you're printing it. Because if you, if you can't like guarantee to pay for the design, why do designers spend time designing these files? Are you just gonna steal them and print them? And, and so uh, they, they found blockchain-based solutions to control for that so that there's an economic incentive to design cool files. And so th the military is now printing spare parts in the field as they need them and paying like Northrop Grumman or whoever for the right to do that because they're the ones who did the design work. Um, it, it goes on and on. It gets really freaky, sci-fi cool uh, pretty quickly. And these, these are good examples because then we can figure out, you know, and relate them to our industry. So Vashal, what do you see as the biggest hurdle for the industry when it comes to harnessing blockchain and reaping potential rewards? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that's the question. That's the big elephant in the room. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, most of our organizations, if you look in the energy sector or in the energy service sector, like where I come from, um, you know, we are used to having centralized control, right? We, we have CEOs, we have CFOs, we have people who are validating contracts, signing off on invoices, and, and you know, all of those things happening. So when we bring in blockchain, it is not only going to decentralize within the organization about how things get done using smart contracts, but it is decentralizing with the external ecosystem as well, right? So, so, I'm, so there is an element of risk averseness that people have, and that comes due to the fear or ignorance about blockchain. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the people still think of blockchain as crypto. I've met a lot of senior people and the moment i say i say hey you know let's see if we can use blockchain to do this part of contracting with our with our ecosystem partners and they're like oh no we are not into crypto right so so i think that's that's the level of ignorance and uh, i'm i'm i want to be very open about it right so we need to we need to break down the concept of blockchain in ways that business leaders can understand on how it brings efficiency and, and, and those kinds of things. And I think that the way the rest of the industry is, or, or the ecosystems around the consumer industry, uh, the finance industry, they are all changing, right? So, so for us, uh, we might be at a Kodak moment in terms of our technology use, in terms of our systems of transactions, system of records. If things are already there on blockchain, uh, you know, then why would you want to have separate systems of records? You know, the traditional ERPs, for example. So, so I think it's it's how do we show that art of the possible using blockchain? I think that's the job that you know we as uh, the evangelists, uh, you know, in blockchain for energy are to 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 tell them the art of the possible, break it down and simplify it so that there is increased adoption and people are willing to try it. So I think I think those are some of the key factors on why adoption is not happening at scale. That that's a great perspective. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, and a big part of it is that you know blockchain solutions are by definition they're interdepartmental or they're interorganizational. Um, they require a lot of political uh, agreement. Um, it's like the last thing you do normally. Is, is that level of, of agreement and coordination, but it's the first thing you have to do in blockchain. And so okay. it's, it's like, we're really demanding a lot of people. Um, and I, I'll give you one other reason what uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technology uh, could be slowed down. Uh, and, and this is gonna sound a little subversive, it's kind of psychological. Um, if you live in uh, an organization, you work in an organization or a department inside of an organization, where your psychological safety depends on your boss not knowing stuff. Like, because when your boss knows things, he starts asking stupid questions and trying to micromanage you uh, or uh, draws the wrong conclusion and starts taking action. But it's like, 
you just got to keep the boss in the dark until after it's too late, right? Uh, I'm sure none of you have ever worked in an organization like that, but trust me, they exist. Um, what the blockchain solution gives you is now, instead of management wondering what's happening, they already know what's happening. And if they're going to you know, criticize you or, or blame you unfairly, now they've got just more ammunition to do that with. Uh, and if I were a middle manager in that kind of a psychological environment, I would find all kinds of reasons why blockchain won't work for us. Because I'm not gonna give my boss another stick to hit me with. Uh, and so with, now what's gonna happen across the industry is these pockets of resistance will get bypassed by other people. And the organizations that have very healthy internal dynamics will adopt the technology more rapidly. The ones that are command and control and fear driven, uh, the law of their middle folks are gonna drag their feet and find excuses uh, and they're not gonna adopt very quickly. And, and that's gonna become an area of competitive advantage for organizations that are serious about treating their people like people. That's a great and, point. Go ahead, Raquel. No, I just wanted to add that another hurdle that I've seen is, uh, is more of the trying it alone, you know, trying to solve the equation of blockchain on your own as an isolated group. Uh, that's, that's a big one. This is a collaborative tool. Uh, Thomas, as you were mentioning at the very beginning, it doesn't work if, if you build it for in one sided, you know, it, it has to be a some a solution that is work for all the participants to yeah. make it work, you know? It, it's so a big, in those heavy rules, technical lift, but it pays for itself if you're coordinating people who are hard to coordinate previously. But, exactly. You know, for one person, it's like, I, I'm already coordinated with myself. I mean, what am I, what am I buying? Um, <laughs> exactly. Now, there is a great example, I might have mentioned it earlier, I'm sorry. Grant Thornton did a terrific uh, project. I got to see the early demo of it where they were able to show how a, a a multinational with many, many divisions where each division had a different ERP system. Um, they built a blockchain backbone underneath it. And so anytime two ERP systems had a transaction that affected both of them, the stuff that was internal, they didn't care about. But if it crossed boundaries, they put a record of it on this blockchain and they would have uh, copies of all of the important documents put into IPFS, which is, uh, I won't try to explain that. And so you could months later say, oh, this transaction with those guys over there, uh, wha what's that? What happened six months ago, nine months ago? And you know, without this, this sort of cross-referencing system, you'd be like, uh, give me a week and the team and I'll go try to find out the answer. Um, and now it's like, just a second, click, 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 you know, prove you're authorized to see it. Bip, bip, up come all the PDFs of all the documents involved. Um, it was magical. You could hear people in the audience gasping as this thing was demoed. Uh, and the, the level of integration across multinationals goes from uh, very low and very painful and very cumbersome to very, very high. Uh, and of course, you know, regulatory compliance becomes so much easier because you can answer the questions yep. with confidence. <laughs> so uh, I, I, there's so much uh, opportunity even inside large organizations, but it's got to be multiple parties. You're absolutely correct. So I think that kind of leads us in into this question of is our current ERP systems also preventing us from our in industry being more efficient? And, and we were saying like really moving us to industry 5.0 and, and everyone's talking about industry 4.0. I didn't say that as a mistake. I mean, moving us even beyond that, right? So, um, Vashal, can you kind of yeah. address that one? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's great, and I like the way you used uh, Industry 5.0, and and I think 4.0 was powered by the internet. Uh, 5.0 is going to be powered by how you use the internet uh, with technologies like blockchain, and 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 I think Thomas touched upon it. Uh, you know, he didn't say it in as many words, but essentially, if all the data and transactions are happening on the block uh, or on the chain, then you know, people are going to be asking questions: Do we really need an ERP? Right. So so you know, and 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 you take it down one level. You know, ERPs are notorious in terms of integration with you know, the lower level systems, operating systems, right? The, the control systems and, and the, the, the sensing systems. But what blockchain can do with integration with IoT and sensing 
is it completely changes the game and you it, it can be rule based right so so i think i think we are not far away from uh, our organizations starting to question as more and more adoption happens of blockchain people starting to question uh, why are we using the traditional erp systems that we are using and i think rakel gave an example of how they are using it around chemicals and and all that so if the entire consumption of chemicals payment on chemicals and everything is happening on the blockchain somebody is going to say why, why are we having this erp uh, to do that so Vishal, you represent a part of the ecosystem for the oil field vendors and suppliers. And Raquel, you kind of represent a part of the ecosystem for the operators. Um, and, and that's an important piece of what you were talking about. And we, we talked a little bit about collaboration. Um, quickly, let's get into, you know, what kind of challenges is governance going to present because I think it is connected with collaboration, right? We're gonna have to collaborate to define um, how this, this new digital world and digital way of working is going to be for our near future. So uh, Thomas, can you kind of give us right. a, a view cue, of, of that future? Cue, cue the governance guy, yeah. Um, cue the governance guy. So uh, I, I got interested in blockchain governance in part because everybody kept talking about it and I couldn't understand what they, what they were talking about. What, what do they mean really? Um, and the deeper I dug, the more I realized they didn't know either. Uh, that it was this, <laughs> which kind of felt let out of jail when I realized oh, I'm not the, the one dumb person in the room but we're all kind of equally dumb. Uh, we're finding our way, right? Because this is That's all new right. technology. And what so governance, you know, corporate governance that has to do with you know the board and and you know proving that you did the thing you were supposed to do. Um, blockchain governance is even bigger than that. It's the fact that you have to coordinate with multiple parties everything that happens from bug fixes to upgrades to strategic decisions. What if we want to change the way Grain Chain does its? You know, we want to be able to change rules during the growing season now okay, um, how do we agree to change, right? If you've got a single source of truth and we're gonna change the single source of truth, we all kind of have to agree how we're gonna do that. It's technical decisions, it's timing, it's rollout. There's, there's the, at the enterprise decision, there, there's data definition stuff, there's the business rules encoded maybe in smart contracts or other places. Um, and every single one of those changes is gonna require committee meetings, impact analysis, a rollout plan, uh, it gets really sticky really quick. It's like, an, have you ever been in a homeowners association? It's like, an, it's like your life becomes an endless homeowners association meeting with you get into blockchain because everything's got to get coordinated usually through multiple committees. It's like enterprise architecture on steroids. Uh, and so again, the, the benefit had better be there for you and it helps to get really good at governance and then be able to segment things into different chunks so that they stay uh, clear and distinct from each other. Scheduling is different from technical assessment is different from uh, business impact and so forth. Uh, and I can give you great examples of people who've done a, a terrific job with that. Uh, Chronicled uh, by, or Meta Ledger by Chronicled is one of my favorite examples. Uh, and if we had more time, I'd go into more detail. Let's just say you've got lots of committee meetings ahead of you and please do not skimp on your governance design. So you almost say, why would someone want to even start down this road if, if it's going to be that way, right? Yes. So, it's a lot yes. of work. It is and, a lot of work. Oh, oh, oh. And, if you, and if you just treat this as a technology problem and skip over all the governance and committees and, and by rules and, and bylaws, you just skip all that and let's just do technology. Guess what? But people Thomas, that's, your system. that's people what a lot of people are doing, right? Yeah. And, and then the whole project stalls because the late adopters look at it and say, where are my interests being protected here? How do I know you're not going to pull the rug out from under me? What's, what stops that from happening? And the answer is nothing, because we don't have anything written down, because we didn't bother to invest in our government's design. Yes, and that's exactly one of the things that we can improve. I mean, we in the industry, we have been doing business with each other all the time. We have our vendors that we have been working. And standardization, standards, agreements, that's something that it has happened but there's a lot of gaps in there and inefficiencies. And, and that's where we can start establishing those conversations. That's why it's important to come together 
and establish, use this type of technology to achieve the efficiencies, but we need to come together first and agree on those, on those uh, agreements, rules of engagement. I call them the rules of engagement. Now, how are we gonna work together? We do it in a small pieces. Now let's explode it. You know, we have the technology now that allows us to bring it to the next level. So that's for me the exciting part. We definitely need to continue working in a standardization. We have been working in standards of our, as a as an industry. We need to continue that work because now we have a platform to really harness the benefits of having agreements before uh, and, and using it to improve our efficiency and how we work together and how we distribute data together. So yes, uh, there's a lot of things, as you say, a lot of committees coming, but it's needed. I mean, it's time to do it because now we have the right technology to be really harnessing the benefits of this. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Raquel, I can add a few things there. You know, uh, I think great points made by Thomas and, uh, and Raquel here, but, one thing is blockchain is an evolving system, right? So, and, and, and it needs to change to meet the needs of the participants and the users. And if a blockchain is not relevant and useful, then obviously it won't survive. And it, it has to be able to be able to evolve and adapt. Uh, to evolve, the blockchain needs to make, you know, we need to make changes and needs a way to make the final changes on what these changes should be. So organizations like <clears throat> traditional organizations that we have, they have a leadership team or a CEO who's the final authority, but in blockchain systems, it's designed to be decentralized in its nature and uh, not to be in the control of a person or a group, which means that the blockchain needs another way to make decisions regarding the, the roadmap and blockchain governance in order to be effective, will have to include the incentives and methods for members to coordinate. So, so I think it's uh, governance is going to play a big role and, uh, and you know, some of the, the good governance methods that I've seen uh, work reasonably well are, uh, you know, methods like open governance or on-chain governance. Obviously, I don't want to go into those details, but, but I think there are some established uh, methods out there which can be used by organizations as we bring blockchain into the energy ecosystem and the supply chain. So we're we're getting closer to time. So I just want to wrap this up real quick with um, if, you know, to say to companies out there, I hear a lot of companies say, well, I'll just fast follow or I'll just let, you know, um, it get developed and, and then I'll do, you know, pay attention to blockchain. Um, what, what do you have to say to those companies? Um, Raquel, let's start with you. If you want to be in the game, you have to play it right now. You have to start sitting and developing that governance together. We have to come to the table right now. Otherwise, the fast followers are going to be adhering to the laws that the ones that are putting them together right now are going to be healthy. And as, uh, as Vishal said, it has to evolve. But if you start sitting down right now, you will evolve with it. So it will be much easier, much faster to adopt for you and have, harness the benefits. So come join us in the conversation. Thank you, Vishal. Yeah, I think it's time to start asking stupid questions, not being afraid of asking stupid questions, right? Silly questions. What is blockchain? What does it mean for us? Uh, how can I bring it in and, and start to read about it, start to engage with people who, uh, who are who are trying to do this like blockchain for energy consortium right so it's as a great platform where people can come and ask questions it's a safe place uh, and, and and I think I think it's like I said it's a Kodak moment for uh, for technology use in the industry so the early adopters will get rewards and so come to the party yeah great Thomas can you wrap I, us up on this I would say uh, if you think you can fast follow um, think again because by the time you get engaged, your competitors have already set up the rules, things are operating, and they're already taking your market share away from you. And they've already adapted their internal processes and culture to uh, handle the new way of working and the new way of cooperating. Uh, that takes time. Uh, when you choose the fast follow strategy, you're basically seeding initiative, market share, and uh, evolutionary time to your competitors. And uh, you, you will not make it back. 
this is an important technology and it's going to affect everybody in not only in your industry, but even in your personal lives. So I would say it's very important that you understand it. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I, I think it was a great discussion and um, hopefully we'll, we'll all come back together again and, and have these conversations with even deeper uh, decisions around governance and all the other pieces that, that this technology is going to give for this industry. 